it's five o'clock in the morning. I can't sleep. Now, that's not unusual. I worked in morning radio for years, and I suspect I will forever be awake, dark, and early. So I take my big dog bear out for a walk. The sky's mostly clear, so I can see the stars twinkling, and a massive full moon hangs over the forest. Today I'll be doing something I haven't done in years. I'm going to a press conference. Now, press conferences are a regular occurrence in the daily news biz. But I said so long to that grind years ago when I started Island Crime. Today is different, though. Today, police are updating Amber Manthorne's case. Amber has now been missing from her Port Alberni home for more than two years. You'll recall that Amber was reported missing on July 8, 2022. A reminder, initially, Amber is thought to be in the company of her former boyfriend, Justin Hall, perhaps traveling in her new white Jeep Compass. But then her car is found, abandoned south of Nanaimo, and Justin turns up too. But not Amber. She has never been found. Vancouver Island's Integrated Major Crime Unit has had Amber's case for more than two years. I've made multiple requests for interviews. The community is anxious for updates on this case. But for two years, it's been radio silence. And then this. Media Advisory, October 16th, 2024. Port Alberni RCMP News Conference. New details being released as police continue to seek public assistance as the search for Amber Manthorn continues. New photos and video will be available. As soon as word gets out that a press conference about Amber is coming, the speculation begins. Has Amber been found? Is there a big break in the investigation? Why now? I check in with Amber's friends and family. They've known this was about to happen for some time. There are so many questions. I'm Laura Palmer, and this is an update to Island Crime Season 4, Finding Amber. This is Episode 9, The Dark Grey Tote. Earlier this summer, Amber's friends and family gathered to say their goodbyes to Amber. I was there too. It was a beautiful summer afternoon in July. Amber's celebration of life is held out in Beaver Creek at a community hall near the Stamp River Provincial Park. It's a really pretty spot, and I smile as I recall Amber's friends lovingly calling her a Beaver Creek princess. Inside, friends and family gather around tables, sharing stories and memories of Amber. I see my hairdresser there. She was a friend of Amber's. And I spot a couple of the friends I interviewed for the series. I recognize Amber's sister here, too. There are posters covered in images of beautiful Amber, full of life. I make my way over to where Amber's mom is sitting. We haven't met in person before. I know she and Amber were so very close. I crouch down beside her chair and tell her just how very sorry I am for her loss. Amber's mom tells me just how much she misses her daughter. But she also says she feels Amber's presence is close. Amber was a little mischievous in life. And so at times, Amber's mom senses her daughter in her home, playing small tricks moving items around. Amber's mother is finding some comfort in the idea that her daughter's playful spirit is still with her. Today, it's Amber's corporeal existence we are focused on. Check, one, two, one, two. I mean, CTV, I mean, global. Oh. You've uh, got about five minutes Sorry. just to wait for any uh, late shows. I'm at this news conference in the hope that police could have answers about where Amber's body will be found. 
the first voice you'll hear belongs to Constable Beth O'Connor. She's Port Alberni RCMP's media relations officer. The Port Alberni RCMP are issuing a plea to the public for information that would assist in locating Amber Manthorne. On July 8th, 2022, at 7.30 p.m., the Port Alberni RCMP received a report that Amber Manthorne was missing from her residence on Central Lake Road in Port Alberni. Despite numerous investigative efforts, along with appeals to the public for information, Amber has not been located. Police believe that Amber's disappearance was a result of foul play and that she's not likely to be found alive. Amber's boyfriend, Justin Hall, is considered a person of interest in Amber's disappearance. However, he was located deceased in Merritt, BC last year, which has limited our access to answers. Justin's identity, his status, and his relationship to Amber is something that's being released today to hopefully advance our investigation. The investigation has established some key mo movements, rather, of Amber's vehicle, which is a white 2021 Jeep Compass around the time of her disappearance. Specifically, investigators are releasing a timeline in hopes that witnesses may come forward with relevant information. On July 7th at 3.27 p.m., Amber Manthorn was seen alone on CCTV at Bilo Foods in Port Alberni. Amber purchased some groceries and departed in her vehicle. At 3.35 p.m., a white SUV consistent with Amber's was observed driving west on Pacific Rim Highway near the Shashat Market. Amber arrives at her residence around this time. On July 8th at 12.22 a.m., Justin Hall places a call to United Cabs from the Petro Canada on River Road. 22 minutes later, a cab is observed on CCTV near Sashot Market traveling west. At 4.17 a.m., a white SUV consistent with Amber's is captured on CCTV driving east on Pack Rim Highway towards Port Alberni. At 4.50, AM, Amber Manthorne's vehicle enters the Husky gas station on 3rd Avenue in Port Alberni. We're going to play that video for you now. At this point in the press conference, I'm sitting with all the other journalists. And there's also a group of Amber's friends who've gathered at the RCMP detachment for this press conference. Before the conference had started, there was something of a collegial, friendly feeling to this gathering. The local reporters mostly know each other, and they help each other out, testing mics, getting set up. But as soon as this video begins playing, you can hear a pin drop. I look over at Amber's friends. This must be just gutting to watch. Now, the entire video is one minute and six seconds long. It's CCTV footage taken at a gas station. It happens to be the Husky gas station I use regularly. We see Amber's white Jeep compass pull up. It's dark outside, 4.50 in the morning. Justin Hall gets out of the driver's side. He's wearing a dark, long sleeve shirt, dark jeans, and Nike flip-flops over top some socks. He has a gray ball cap on. Justin retrieves a large blue-gray suitcase from the back seat and proceeds to the back of Amber's Jeep before opening the back hatch. At this point, he tries to wedge the suitcase beside a large dark gray tote with a loose lid held on by what appear to be bungee cords. But the suitcase won't fit, and he returns to the car. Here's RCMP Constable Beth O'Connor picking up what happens after that. On July 8th at 7.02 a.m., Amber's vehicle is observed on CCTV at McDonald's on Johnson Road in Fort Alberni, where Justin makes a purchase. At 8 a.m., Amber fails to show up for work. At 9.22 a.m., Justin Hall makes a purchase at the Walmart in Nanaimo. 
At 10.26 a.m., Amber's vehicle is captured on CCTV at the BC Ferry Terminal at Duke Point in Nanaimo. Justin Hall is the loan occupant. He purchases a ferry ticket, then proceeds to the lineup to wait for the ferry. At 11.03 a.m., Amber's vehicle is captured on CCTV, leaving the Duke Point Ferry Terminal with Justin driving. At 3.08 p.m. on July 9, 2022, Lady Smith RCMP respond to a call and recover Amber's vehicle abandoned at McGulvery Way and Creekwood Place, Lady Smith. Additionally, Amber's cell phone appears to have a case capable of carrying credit cards on the outer shelf. As this cell phone has never been recovered, police are inter interested in anyone who may have located a phone matching the description sometime between July 8th and now. <clears throat> the investigation remained active from the onset with evolving details that investigators needed to access, manage, and explore. If anyone has located or locates a bin similar to the one seen on the CCTV or a cell phone similar to the one in the photos, they are urged to call us immediately. We will keep searching until she's found, but we need your help to bring Amber home to her family. Sergeant Chet Carroll recently met with Lorraine, Amber's mother. Amber's family wants to bring her home. Anyone with information on the whereabouts of Amber Manthorne or anyone who may know what happened to her, we're asking them to call their local police or if they want to remain anonymous, they should call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Next, the reporters gathered in the room are allowed to ask questions. They are answered by Sergeant Chet Carroll from the Port Alberni RCMP's General Investigation Section. You'll hear the voices of some of my colleagues, and I ask a few questions as well. I'm uh, Sergeant Chet Carroll. We are hopeful by releasing this information that somebody will come forward with information. Um, the phone is unique. It could be somebody that found it already and didn't know the significance of this phone with a cover. It could have been located with another phone, as well as the bin. The bin has never been recovered. The bin is hinged. It has a hinged top. It is domed top to it. It has um, built-in handles, um, and we need to find these things to further our investigation. We're also hopeful that somebody that knows more about Justin Hall may have information that they're willing to bring forward, and we believe that's going to lead us to Amber. And that's our goal from Port Alberni, is to find Amber and to, to, to put, put that to rest and, and give that closure to her. So does he remain the sole person of interest in the crime? He would be the only person of interest that I am aware of. Um, there are no other persons of interest that I am aware of. So the police believe her body was in that tote? We can't say that her body was in the tote, but we don't want to ignore the fact that it's never been recovered. We, we want to be open to all the possibilities, um, but we don't know that absolutely. How has the, the investigation advanced since Justin Hall's death? We would not be releasing details like this if it was viable. Um, so with Justin Hall not being a part of the picture, we were going to release more information than we would if the homicide was continuing in that direction. That makes sense. Why is it taking so long to, to release um, this information uh, to, to the public? Investigations, foul play, missing persons, homicides take a long time to investigate. They take a ton of resources. Uh, we pay attention to um, case law such as Regina versus Jordan and having a solid case to move forward. Um, it is not unrealistic for investigations like this to take two, three, four years to further. This information um, is being released. We've had some time to review the investigation and see where we're at. And we feel it's important to release more details to trigger other people to call, to, to let people know we're still here and we want to hear what they have to say. 
Um, given the timeline you laid out, what area do, are you focused on in terms of the search? We don't want to limit it to an area. So we've given all the timeline in order for people that know specifics to other areas um, to come forward. We don't want to say that it's absolutely focused in Port Alberni, which we believe the phones never left Port Alberni, which is a key detail. We think the phones are still here somewhere or somebody in Port Alberni may have recovered them. But I don't want to say that absolutely because it is possible that they were turned off and moved with somewhere else. We know that they pinged off of towers in Port Alberni for several days after it was she was reported missing. Um, and we know she was active on her phone up up until late in the night on July 7th. Um, so we want to release that information. We want to get that out there. We want people to focus on anything to do with Cassidy area near the airport where the vehicle was recovered. Anybody with knowledge there. Um, there's a tremendous amount of, of community response on this file, which was was amazing. It showed how much the community cared about this and, and bringing Amber home. So that that huge response covered off so much area. Because of that, we didn't feel we felt that if she was obviously somewhere close to a road or, or not somewhere unique, that she would have been recovered. So by releasing this extra detail, it might just trigger somebody else to come forward that gets us that last piece that we need. What, what makes you think Justin uh, may have re revealed something to any of his, any people he was close to? Do you have any specific evidence of that? I think being a person of interest, and, and we believe that he may have been one of the last people to see her, if not the last person. So he could have shared uh, an intimate detail about something that gives us that. Or it could be the fact that somebody knows more about uh, Justin and where he went in Cassidy or in Nanaimo. And that may help us. But the, the key is the phone, the tote, and within the areas that we've showed in our timeline, that is very important to us. And if we have information that we can go out and deploy um, some of our resources to those areas and confirm details, which we've done hundreds of times on this file, uh, we've, we had the organized search and rescue out. They brought boats with cameras underneath them to, to go through Great Central Lake right after she went missing. Um, the, I'll call them convergent volunteers, but there was a huge response from the public. Volunteer divers have been in the lake um, and, and done tons of things to cover off areas. But these unique details, we hope will trigger more information to come forward, which is what we're hopeful of. Sir, how would you characterize the missing uh, case of Amber Medville from the start? Um, frustrating. Uh, it, the details and the um, the techniques that we deployed would typically locate a missing person um, because of the foul play and and other details. It, it adds a whole different aspect to this investigation. Um, it, it's complex, and um, we just we want the message to be: help us find Amber, help us bring closure to the family and friends. How, how often, uh, or how many times, did you interview Justin Paul before he died? Sorry, I'm, I don't mean you specifically. I, the police. How many times was he? I can't speak to the amount of times. I don't have that at my disposal right now. But he was the the key part was right after Amber was reported missing. He was interviewed and provided detail that didn't didn't help with our investigation whatsoever. So, what steps, given given that that was not helpful, what steps were you able to take to try and gain information from? 
the focus at that time was not on Justin. It was on where is Amber. And some of that overlapped where we would cover off details that applied to both. And like everybody's aware, in the beginning, he was also listed as missing because he wasn't accounted for. But we were able to, to locate him within a few days. Um, so that avenue was peripheral, focused on Justin. It was more where is Amber and what details are going to be missed Amber. This video footage is pretty compelling and must have changed the investigation quite a bit and in your dealings with him. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if the video was definitive in that. Um, we could make a ton of assumptions from the video, um, but we don't want to be narrow-minded in our view. We want to be open-minded, and we want to focus on what's going to lead us back to Amber. When did you obtain that? That video within uh, a day of it, and her being reported missing. We had that video quite quick. And um, the, the timeline um, did, did Justin um, board the ferry with Amber's vehicle? I'll, I'll correct you there. He never boarded the ferry. Okay. He, he was paid for the ferry and in the lineup to go across to the mainland and chose not to go across and exited the ferry terminal. The Duke Point Ferry Terminal. And with with Amber's vehicle? Yes. Okay. At the time of Justin's death, where were you at in terms of the possibility of charging Justin for you? Were you close or you said he was a person of interest? So there are a lot of uh, units in the RCMP responsible for this investigation. And Portal Burning RCMP was only involved in the missing person aspect of this file. So I can't speak to anything to do for that. We'll take one more question if there's any more. So her vehicle was found in Nanaimo. Did Justin live there? And are the Nanaimo RCMP involved in searching as well? So in the beginning, when the vehicle was recovered in Cassidy, sort of uh, south of the Nanaimo area by the airport, we deployed uh, search and rescue in that area. So we had uh, the volunteer search and rescue crew there uh, respond and search around the vehicle. There were further searches done in that area, um, but there's nothing conclusive that came out of that. And just like that, the news conference is over. As I leave the RCMP station, I see some of Amber's dear friends huddled together outside. They don't want to be speaking to the media. They want the focus on what the police are asking of the public. They want the focus on finding Amber. Here's Amber's close pal, Cheryl Payne. I'm just putting out a plea that if you know anything, it's time to step forward and tell us what you know. Um, we just need closure. So it's time to step forward. This day, which started out clear, has now turned gloomy. Heavy rains are coming. Honestly, it fits my mood. It's been a heavy day. Seeing that video of Justin in those early hours, shifting that tote, which could well contain Amber's remains, is hard to watch. I'm thinking of Amber's friends and family, and especially her mom. Today's press conference answers some questions, but it raises many more. In the video, Justin appears calm. He's steady. He's not rushing. He's not fidgeting. I think about him stopping at McDonald's early that morning, grabbing himself a bite to eat, what was going through his mind as he ordered his food and then drove towards Nanaimo? Why didn't he make that ferry trip? Where is Amber's cell phone? Where is the dark gray tote? Where is Amber? I'm Laura Palmer, and this is Island Crime Season 4, Finding Amber. This is Episode 9, The Dark Gray Tote.
And just a word here, I've pulled this episode together on my own quite quickly, and I feel like it's important to get this information out about Justin, about this dark gray tote, sooner rather than later. It's possible the audio you're listening to may not be as clear as you've come to expect in my later seasons. So please understand, I decided it was more important to get this out quickly than to wait for a more polished episode.